This is another IL-2 simulated combat mission. It attempts to recreate a day similar to July 10th, 1942, when Gustav Rodel shot down three P-40s over North Africa. The opening scene takes place at 7 a.m. in the morning when two pilots, having finished breakfast, try to ride on what's supposed to be a Kubelwagen to a takeoff area where two other pilots are waiting. As they drive, we're getting a tour of the base. Here's some aircraft from two Grupa. Number one was flown by Sinner, and yellow two was flown by Schultz. Here's another four aircraft. These are part of one Grupa. One of the aircraft was flown by Stahlschmidt. Red one is Stahlschmidt's. It's got quite a few victory markings on the tail. And this one was flown by Marseille. Marseille had already achieved 100 victories by this point in his career, and as a reward, is back in Germany for two months of time off. Here's me. I will be flying in Rodell's aircraft. I don't know about the three Chevrons. Rodell was group commander of two group, and later in April of 43, he led all of JG-27. And at that time, he flew an aircraft that looked more like this with the three Chevrons. He might have just been flying white four at this time. And I added the two group horizontal bar, which was just kind of a guess. Next to him is the aircraft of Franz Stiegler, White 12. Franz joined JG-27 as a rookie in April of 1942. Already had thousands of civilian air hours flown. He lost White 12, was hit by ground fire early in the war, so he might not have even been flying it at this time, or at least he, he lost the first aircraft he was flying. I was motivated to do this mission because of a book about Franz Stiegler that I had read. It's called A Higher Call, and it was written by Adam Makos. He did a really good job not only describing the air warfare, but the hardships of life in the Luftwaffe, and how Franz Stiegler found himself in that position. see the tropical dust filter. I noticed later on that the Hurricanes should have a Volks filter. This airfield is at Potaifia, Egypt. Although it could have been an amalgam of places, JG-27 had been in Sidi Barani just a few weeks before as they followed Rommel's advance. The mission is to escort Stuka dive bombers who are attempting to stop an advance by the British outside El Alamein. 
This field is only 15 minutes from the front line. I like how the tail wheel retracts in the 109Fs. Pilots preferred flying earlier in the morning because of the coolness. It was uh, really hot in the desert at noontime. JG-27 had a reputation for loving to shoot down airplanes, but not loving to kill pilots. As a result, Rodell didn't paint victory markings on his rudder. Stiegler decided to follow his lead and not paint victory markings on his rudder either. Somewhere about the end of July, I believe Stiegler became an ace. Rodell already had about 40 victories at this time. Franz described some sort of a taxiway at this airbase, so I attempted to create that. You can see some of the camouflage netting around the base that the aircraft were placed under. At some of the makeshift airfields, the pilots slept in tents, and you can see about a dozen light-colored tents in the background here. The Stukas are flying overhead, so we're trying to catch up to them and escort them. Because of the short distances traveled during the North African campaign, the Stukas are at an altitude of only 2,000 meters. They didn't have time to climb much higher. Rodell flew in Spain before World War II. He also flew in Poland, Belgium, France, the Battle of Britain, Russia, North Africa, Greece, back to North Africa, Sicily, Southern Italy, Germany, and Normandy. He spent the latter part of 1944 and 45 as a staff officer. His last victory was in July of 1944. He managed to accumulate 98 victories all of them against Western Allies except for one, and I believe all of them flying the Messerschmitt 109. Stiegler also survived the war. He flew until the very last days of the war, flying ME-262s with JD-44. Egyptian coastline, headed for El Alamein. The battlefront had shifted back and forth several times. The British were attacked by the Italians who were trying to gain new territory in Libya. Uh, the British managed to push them back and then Rommel and the Germans became involved and they pushed the British back to El Alamein. Time-lapse video, the trip along the coast to the target has been sped up from 15 minutes to just a few minutes. My flight has gotten ahead of the Stukas. 
were two or three minutes ahead of them, looking for British fighters. JG-27 would sometimes fly missions like this three times a day. It was uh, really exhausting for the pilots. Stiegler had become involved in a controversy where several pilots were accused by their fellow pilots of inflating their scores. And I think their main motivation for doing that was to get the two-month time-off reward for achieving a certain threshold of aircraft shot down. I'm thinking I see fighter activity inland a bit, so I'm turning the flight inland. I spotted fighters below. My flight's breaking up to attack. I'm going to follow white six. I've spotted a P-40 down below. I missed on the head-on pass. I got white six. Spotted another P 40. It's open. There are a ton of P 40s out there Tomahawks and Kitty Hawks. Back on white six. He's a busy guy. Looks like he smoked another P-40. There are a couple of freighters in this harbor at El Alamein. One of them's armed, and it's shooting. There's 
who's Franz. It's like he's having a bad day with a bunch of P-40s chasing him. Fortunately, the BF-109 F-4 is a little bit faster than P-40s. Okay, meanwhile, while the fighters were busy, the Stukes are approaching their target. This happened a couple minutes earlier. British tanks are headed west towards the front line. For some reason, the Stuka is headed inland instead of going out towards the Mediterranean. That extended the time they were in enemy territory. Stukas flying overhead, all four of them are flying over the, the area they just bombed.
unfortunately their escort is busy with tons of P-40s back inland. And there's a couple of hurricanes that have spotted them. Looks like more than just a couple of hurricanes too. There's several P-40s in the area. It's uh, number one Stuka. For some reason, the B-40s gave up their attack. Maybe they were low on ammunition. replay. This P-40 has lost his rudder. I'm going to make a second pass on that P-40. There's an air base that's not too far inland, just a mile or two from here. rudderless P-40. This is a replay. I smoked him, but he still won't go down. I'm looking for him again to make a third pass.
way. Pilot got out, but he was at pretty low altitude when he bailed. I think Franz, my wingman, got shot up and went home. The other three of us are still out here looking for P-40s, although I think number six is low on ammunition. The cannon in the BF-109 F-4 fires for 17 seconds, and it's got two rifle caliber machine guns above the engine. They're pretty useless, but they can fire for about 33 seconds. There are two P-40s returning from the Stuka attack, which I'm seeing now. That's me in pursuit. Some of these P-40s have shark mouths and some don't. Me pursuing the P-40 with white 6 and white 7 behind me. I'm still trying to go after that rightmost P-40. Cannon ammunition is gone, now I'm just using the two rifle caliber guns. I can appreciate what a challenge it was for Rodell to get three P-40s this day. With only 17 seconds of cannon ammunition. Well, my machine guns are empty now, too. I don't see any damage to that P-40, although I thought I saw hits when I was chasing them. Well, I guess that's it. We're all out of ammo. I'm going to head back west towards my base. I don't know how Marseille could do that. He'd get like six or seven aircraft in a single combat mission with only 17 seconds of ammo. With a little time-lapse photography, the 15-minute flight has been reduced in duration, so now I'm back near the base.
course, my aircraft. I'm flying alone for the moment. The base is ahead and on the left. This base seems to have been uh, pretty primitive. Franz recollected how he would hang out in a foxhole, which he called a grave. They'd put a cover over the top, or he'd put his own cover over the top and just lie in there. I think that the base got bombed and strafed quite a bit. quick circle of the base, get my gear down, and try to land. Stop. Here's Franz's plane looking in pretty good shape for all the P-40s that were chasing him. This is Franz coming in for a landing. other parked aircraft off in the background. This is all JG-27. They're the same four aircraft from one group. Thanks for telling your story, Franz. I really enjoyed the book, A Higher Call. I highly recommend it. So now there's a few more clips following the end of my story. Here's White 6 and 7. Truth be told, I did merge several missions. I flew this mission 10 times and put together an amalgam of about four of those missions. And some of them, White 6 and 7, survived, and some they didn't. This is another landing attempt by me. You can see Franz on my left. We landed uh, in tandem in that mission. In the 10 missions, I only survived to land three times. And none of the landings were good. Well, at least I missed the ground crew. Here's that P-40 I shot down that lost his rudder. This is showing how he lost it. I think that was number six that blew off his rudder. Here's a P-40 that doesn't have the beautiful shark mouth that the classic P-40s have. RAF squadron number 112 put shark mouths on their P-40s, and the American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers, picked it up from them. Here's a Hurricane Mark II C with the four cannons on it. 
you can see the camouflage, how well the plane blends in with the background. This is showing what four cannons can do. The Mark II C seems a little sluggish. British aircraft outnumbered us three to one in most of these versions, although I was getting shot down so much I reduced it to just two to one by removing the hurricanes that were in the combat. In the book, German pilots claim they were outnumbered ten to one in North Africa. I should mention that the book A Higher Call deals with, uh, not, well it does cover a lot of the combat that Ron's experienced, and it does deal with one particular episode with an American B-17 that was crippled and that Stiegler let go, although he shot down plenty of bombers before and after that one. He wound up, I think, with about 28 victories, and he might have even stopped counting at some point. But the book is not so much just about that, but uh, it also deals with life outside of the cockpit how he got involved with the Luftwaffe. He didn't volunteer, exactly. You kind of were told you were going to be in the Luftwaffe. Deals with the party, and how very few German pilots were members of the Nazi party. And that really, only about 40% of Germans had voted for the Nazis. The pilots were wary of new pilots who were members of the Nazi party. They actually interviewed them to find out if that was the case. They didn't want party members reporting back and getting you in trouble for making a disparaging remark about how the war was going or something. The book also mentions the pilots' disgust for Garrett, head of the Luftwaffe, and how towards the end of the war there was a pilot's insurrection where Garing was confronted by a group of senior pilots. As a result, some of the pilots were banished to uh, an ME 262 unit, JV 44, where it was hoped that they would be killed off. Some of the personnel standing around the base. You can see the bomb craters. I set off a flare at one time, too, to make it easier to find the runway, but I only did that for the first few missions. 